I'm David Wiseman. This is my story, Deja Vu. It is late September and what passes for autumn colour in the city is already fading. The leaves in the park are churning to brown mush under leaden skies as the writer scuttles back to her apartment. She is small and wiry and despite her years she is, as yet, unaffected by the ailments of age. Her eyes are bright and inquiring. She walks with vigour and a smile. In her bag she has a magazine from the newsstand by the metro steps. A successful career stretching back over nearly six decades has never dulled her appetite for a good review. She anticipates the latest with a familiar frisson of excitement. It is small and secret vanity in an outwardly modest life. She settles with tea, her lapsang souchong, which she likes as much for its name as for its taste. Slowly and deliberately, she turns the pages to the reviews, taking pleasure in delaying the climax. Her latest collection of stories, Present Tense, is the lead in the section, as befits an author of her standing. The reviewer likens the writing to a champion boxer returning once too often to the ring, to the retired politician wheeled out to pronounce on world affairs long after losing touch with them. Words such as tired, rehashed, worn out, litter the review. Clichéd is the most hurtful. In alarm, the writer recognises the review as being identical to one she's seen before. Her misery is compounded by the thought that two reviewers have felt exactly the same. But surely they couldn't be the same review. Perhaps she has picked up that other magazine by mistake. Quickly she checks. No, it is definitely the one she has just brought home. She looks again, but the moment of recognition has passed. It was a false impression, an aberration. There is only one review, only one voice raised in regretful but cutting criticism. A month passes, during which the writer has other tantalising flashes of bogus memory. A bus driver greeting her as she climbs aboard on a freezing morning. A stranger turning to smile as he steps into the elevator. Two women arguing in the street, breaking off to stare as she passes. All trivial, all moments she might once have tucked away, cataloguing them in her storehouse of incidents from which she creates her wonderful stories. Now she can only stare in momentary confusion. In November, she receives a letter from her publisher, her only publisher, since they took that gamble with her all those years ago a gamble which has paid off so well for all concerned. Before she even reads it, the process of opening the envelope, of unfolding the paper, has the same shock of recognition as accompanied the bad review. They write to say, present tense, has poor sales, and wonder if she would undertake a series of appearances to boost the title and breathe new life into her older ones. She has never received such a letter before, but the déjà vu persists, right through to the signature at the bottom. The feeling is so strong that the sense of disappointment doubles, as if a second book has failed exactly as a previous one has done. By Christmas, the episodes, she calls them that because it is a word she likes and saves properly identifying them, have become more frequent. Once a week, twice a week, daily, some remain no more than flashes, but gradually, the longer experiences that started with her publisher's letter have become more common. She has politely refused the speaking tour and the annual office party. It is the first she has missed since they began 43 years previously. She has rejected all further contact with the publisher and her agent, claiming that she is working on something new. She has become a recluse. Snide commentators whisper she is a spent force, that she is overdue a Lifetime Achievement Award before her decline becomes terminal. What they do not know is that the ideas, the characters and the plots, the unexpected twists, the sideways looks at life which are her trademark, all continue to flow as richly as ever. But as each appears fresh and original, the writer finds them instantly familiar. From which story she is not sure. She has written many stories, but worse thoughts trouble her. 
they may be fugitives from another writer's story. Before the end of January, she has ceased the regular rhythms of eating and drinking, of walking and working. These are the good habits which have sustained her all her adult life, and without them she meanders listlessly through the days. Life becomes a mystifying succession of what she might have called double takes, had she still been writing. But she is not. She has ceased to be a writer. She takes to her bed. Sleep offers her no respite. Her dreams repeat themselves endlessly. Only in the shifting no man's land, between sleep and waking, wrapped in the cocoon of her bedclothes, does she find any semblance of peace. Here, briefly and without the taint of repetition, scenes and characters continue to appear fully formed. These have always been the most fertile moments of her day, a place where she could hold a few of the brightest images, long enough to taste them, long enough to smell the tar or the salt or the pine needles carried on the wind, long enough to hear their stories whispered in the grass. As a child, before she thought of writing a word, she could hold these waking dreams in trance-like suspension for as long as she wished. Within a week, this last refuge collapses. The fruits of imagination tumbling over themselves in quick-fire chaos, tears and laughter merging and melting in an instant. They form and fade and reform so quickly she can no longer be sure they are there at all, lost in an incomprehensible blur. Searching for meaning in her own thoughts requires huge effort. It utterly exhausts her. Time loses its shape. On the second Thursday of a bitter February, three men stand at the door of the writer's apartment. One is a policeman who, 20 years ago, often exchanged good mornings with the writer outside this same apartment building. The second is from the building's owners. He too has memories of the writer when he first started in this brownstone block as a glorified janitor. The other is the writer's agent, and it is he who has convened their gathering. He has stood at this door many times as her friend for half a lifetime, and in the long ago, as her occasional lover. The uneasy trio bang and shout at her door. Then they wait in awkward silence, their wet boots making pools on the polished floor while they hesitate. The former janitor has keys that do not fit the lock, but they have come prepared with a battering ram. They exchange expressions of regret and resignation before the policeman smashes the lock with a single blow. The writer's home is dark and fetid. Her lover hangs back, covering his mouth and nose with his hand, unwilling to be the one to find her. The policeman and the property agent move with more purpose. They know where to go and what to expect. They've seen it all before. In late March, the magazine which so injured the writer's pride and witnessed the first of her episodes publishes the last of the wave of eulogies which have followed her death. The circumstances of her lonely passing were announced a day too late for the March edition, so their fulsome tribute has had to wait for April's. The delay has allowed for more depth and better research, but ultimately they have nothing original to add to the thousands of words that have flowed over and round her life and work. On the page following this outpouring of praise, the magazine has its regular list of best-selling titles. The writer is responsible for no less than five of the 20 listed, an achievement trumpeted as being unprecedented. There, at the very top of the list, is present tense, decried in this same journal only six months previously for being derivative, lacking spark or originality. With her death, those crabby judgments have morphed from negative to positive. For the collection is now proclaimed as accessible and familiar. Her style is once again trademark and engaging. She would recognise the listing as describing her rightful place in the literary hierarchy. She would probably not recall 
that exactly 20 years previously, the same magazine had also shown her top of the pile with four more of her books close behind. Unprecedented then, as now. Thank you for listening.